Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of Ten or Less, the educational podcast series where I take a boring chapter from a textbook and I turn it into a video 10 minutes or less for your enjoyment. Today we'll be continuing our environmental science overview with non-renewable energy sources. Now this information has been adapted from the G. Tyler Miller's textbook, Living in the Environment, 15th edition. So um, if any of you guys environmental science students are using uh, are looking for information, this will be it. So let's go straight into it. Uh, number one, conventional oil. Conventional oil is a powerful source of fuel that provides a lot of energy, but burning it releases carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. These can go on to trigger global warming and climate change, causing the greenhouse effect to slowly go out of control. Now, just a quick note here, there is a difference between the greenhouse effect and global climate change. The global climate change that we talk about when we think about the world ending, that's what happens when the greenhouse effect goes out of control, when it gets too out of hand. The greenhouse effect by itself is not inherently bad or good. It's just there to help us, help the Earth stay at a nice warm temperature and keep us alive. So first of all, some of the good things about oil. Well, there's enough of it for about 75 years, according to this textbook. And it's very cheap with government subsidies, provides a lot of energy when you burn it, and there's already an efficient distribution system because the technology is really well developed. You can think of this as cars, you have t oil tankers, oil pipelines. Technology has been around for a long time, and we've been using coal or oil for a long time, so it's really well you know, societies will adjust it to it. Some of the downsides is we're running out of it really quickly, and the artificially low prices encourages waste. That four dollars a gallon that you're spending at the gas station for oil nowadays isn't doesn't actually reflect the true cost of how much damage it's doing to the environment or how much energy it took out or it took to pull that oil out of the ground and refine it. Um, the subsidies that the government gives to the oil companies um, when you pick up gas at the at the gas station, it's actually a lot cheaper than you would normally pay for it. And finally, the biggest thing, air pollution. We know about it, everyone knows about it, it's all over the news. Burning oil creates a lot of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide being one of the major ones. So that's conventional oil. Moving on to the next one, heavy oils from shale oil, or oil shales and oil sands. Now these are thicker, more tar-like oils that can be pulled from shale or sands. Um, they provide an extra supply to help the dwindling supplies of conventional oil, but retrieving it ca cause environmental impacts. The burning of heavy oils produces similar, if not more, air pollutants to greenhouse gases like the burning of conventional oils. Now, there's nothing really different about the heavy oils from um, shale and oil, uh, sands, but the big different, uh, the big thing here is we're looking to supplement the supply. We're not looking to create a completely new source of energy, but since oil is something that we are so used to, we're looking for another source of oil to just supplement. Um, moderate costs, easily transported because we're still using the same types of modes of transportation. Potentially large supply because there's a lot of resources that we haven't untapped yet, that we have not un have not tapped yet, excuse me. Next, the technology is well developed because it's still technically oil. But here's the problem, N low net energy yield, which means we have to spend a lot more energy pulling this out of the ground and refining it than we do really from getting it. Um, you require a lot of water for processing, severe land disruption, severe water pollution, and you're still burning it in the end, which also causes air pollution. And that's the pros and cons of heavy oils from oil shale and oil sands. Next, natural gas. Natural gas usually form in the found of methane. Stores of it are found above reservoirs of crude oil, and these gases occur naturally in the environment and only until recently have been burned off as a byproduct of oil drilling. So if we just take a quick look at the, one of the pictures here, if you've seen um, oil rigs like this or oil drilling um, machines with long pipes uh, burning off fire at the end, at the top, that's not oil they're burning off. That's actually natural gas they're burning off. Uh, they mainly do this because sometimes it's not even worth it trying to capture it because it's so it costs so little. Um, so the benefits: there's a lot of ample supply, low cost thanks to government subsidies again, um, high net energy yield, and it produces less pollution compared to other fossil fuels when you burn it. The downsides: it's not renewable as well. It produces air pollution. The methane can leak from the tubes or the pipes that you ship it in. 
um, difficult to ship to another country simply because it's a gas and you have to figure out, figure out a way to capture it, put it into canisters, and then ship it across. And it's a lot more difficult than just doing it, um, shipping it with oil. You require a pipeline to move it around. Sometimes it's just burned off. Then we have natural gas. Next, we've got coal. It's an abundant energy supply that can be easily mined and harvested. By burning coal, we can produce electricity. Um, the coal is pulverized, set on fire, heat to heat a tank of wire, uh, water, excuse me, which is sent through a turbine that generates electricity. Um, one of the big problems with coal, however, um, actually, we'll just get to that soon. Uh, ample supplies. We ex the textbook expects that it to be about 500 years worth of coal that we still haven't mined yet. So there's a lot of coal that we can still tap into. High net energy yield, low cost from government subsidies, and the technology is well developed. I hope you're seeing a pattern here. A lot of energy for very little input and low cost thanks to government subsidies. Some of the downsides are severe land disturbance. You have to break down a lot of land. You have to dig up a lot of earth in order to get to all this coal. High land use, severe threat to human health, and high CO2 emissions when burned. Um, one of the, the dangerous things is when you burn coal, you're also releasing um, sulfur dioxide, mercury, sometimes even radioactive materials um, that can be found in trace amounts. Um, but it does provide a lot of energy for us. And that's coal. Next, we've got conventional nuclear fuel. Uranium and plutonium isotopes undergo nuclear fission generating incredible amounts of heat. This heat is then captured and used to boil water, creating steam that is also used to turn turbines and generate electricity. One thing you'll see is turbines are a very common tool used in order to convert one form of energy into electricity. So you'll see it a lot. The positives of that large fuel supply, very little environmental impact without accidents, moderate land use, and low risk of accidents with current technology. We've gotten pretty good at preventing such um, catastrophes from happening. That being said, it's not, um, it's not competitive with other forms of non-renewable energy sources without government subsidies. Um, it's actually got a low net energy yield despite how much energy it does produce. Catastrophic events can happen. Accidents can occur. If a natural disaster were to, say, damage some safety, uh, safety systems, catastrophic events can happen. And finally, there's no acceptable method with dealing with the waste. Um, terrorism has also been suggested by the textbook, but I'm going to leave that out because it's not strictly environmental science related. Um, but the waste, power, however, is very deadly because we don't know how to deal with the waste. Our best idea now is to just pick it up and shove it into a bunker down deep underneath the mountain. And that's all we do with it. Finally, we have synthetic fuels. Synthetic fuels fall into the category of man-made energy sources. They can, coal can be converted into a synthetic gas or a liquid gas, and it's more expensive than coal because more of it, more coal needs to be mined to produce the same amount of energy. The best benefit is that there's a potentially large supply and it's readily available for vehicle fuel. You can turn it into a synthetic fuel that vehicles can use. However, some of the drawbacks are Ultimately, you're wasting a lot of energy trying to convert all that coal into a vehicle fuels. It costs more than coal because you have to process it further, high environmental impact, high uh, water use, and it increases surface mining costs of uh, mining of coal. And finally, since you're still burning it, along with all this uh, additional processing, you have higher CO2 emissions than coal um, than just burning normal coal. Um, so that's synthetic fuels. Um, you might think synthetic fuels, why would we do this if there are so many negatives to it compared to the benefits? Well, with conventional oil running out, we don't have an easily accessible method of turning non-renewable energy into fuels, which is why synthetic fuels is suggested as one of the things that we can do to help alleviate the fact that we're running out of conventional oil. Anyways, that has been a quick overview of the non-renewable energy sources. I hope you guys enjoy what you guys um, learned from here. and. Hope you guys took good notes, something. Yeah, anyways, thanks for watching.